Judge Frank Woody, uh, William Dickinson, Thomas Marshall, and a Dr. Isidore Cohn were the ones that bought the 16 acres that were the original land that this cemetery started on. Um, and later, Frank Warden and A.J. Cameron also became owners of the cemetery. But in 1901, uh, they decided to get out of the cemetery business, and the city council passed an ordinance, and they bought the cemetery and the, all of the land that's included in it for a dollar, and they set up a board of trustees to oversee the cemetery. Um, I think it's interesting that there was a woman on the first cemetery board, which is quite exciting, and that was, was Mrs. Ward. Uh, in those days, you know, we have, I just like to say, women on a lot of boards in Missoula, but uh, not in those days. It was quite unusual. The biggest sale of the graves was in 1903 when the Northern Pacific purchased two blocks of graves, which included nearly 400 grave sites. And that was so the Northern Pacific could begin to move the Japanese laborers' graves that they, from Plains to Missoula. Uh, many of those graves aren't marked, but some of them do have stones, and, and when we get to the end of our tour, we'll see those and talk about one of them. The Missoula Cemetery is one of the largest in Montana, and some of the names that you might recognize that are included here are the Greenos, the McCormicks, the Hammonds, the McClouds, the Paxons, Jeanette Rankin, the Woodies, the Tools, Brooks, the Bonners, the Patties, the Collins, the Dickinsons, the Marshalls, the Bells, the Higgins, the Wardens, and of course many others. But it sounds like I just got out a map and read to the Missoula streets, doesn't it? So, uh, same old familiar names, but uh, here you'll see where they're laid to rest. Um, now we maintain approximately 40 acres, and there are also an additional 40 acres that haven't been developed. Um, please come with us and, and let's see some of the graves. I doubt that there's a person here that hasn't heard of Jeanette Rankin. Uh, I think many of you probably also know that there are two statues of famous people from each state at Statuary Hall in Washington, D.C. One of Missoula, one of Montana, is indeed Jeanette Rankin. And who's the other one? Not buried in the Missoula Cemetery, but it's Charles Russell. One of those trivia facts. Um, this is a Scotswoman who came to Montana in 1880 and lived in the Grant Creek Valley, which was quite more far out of town in those days than it is now. Uh, she was interested in politics even before she came to Missoula, uh, when she worked in the settlement houses in San Francisco, uh, but when she came to Montana, she ran first for the Montana legislature and was elected to the Montana State House in 1911. Um, interestingly enough, a little note here that says they gave her flowers when she was elected. Uh, again, a woman sort of ahead of her time and, and doing what women in those days didn't usually do. When she arrived in Congress in 1917, the doorkeepers to the House refused to admit her because they were sure that she was simply a lobbyist. She was 36 years old, a fiery redhead, and a lot more than a lobbyist. Um, she and 49 other House members voted against the American entry into World War I. And in 1941, I think we all remember that she was the only person to vote no against entry into that war. And I think that that's something that Montanans always remember her for. Um, her second vote against war, was, in World War II, was political suicide. Uh, she took a stand, and as a result, she was never re-elected. Uh, she lived pretty much in self-imposed poverty, uh, spent the last of her years traveling the world, and she died in 1973, not all that long. One of, one of our more famous Montanans here in this and this, excuse me, this is her family. 
She's very in our lane. Sure. Don't believe a With word on it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Did you say that already? I did. No, I just said she was very here because I thought she was. I said, oh. I'm new. No, no, she's not. <laughs> <laughs> but because she, you know, is a ground breaking woman of history to be the first woman in Congress from our state is really neat, you know, so we include her, her in our I better just read these stories and stories, stones. I think I know. No, you probably know a lot more than I do, it's just I've done this before and I did a lot of research on it. Good. But Marjorie probably actually knows a lot of these people. Well, the ones that are over a hundred I didn't know personally. <laughs> Please, if any of the rest of you hear me telling you something that isn't true, jump in and tell me. Yeah. I'm going to ask out, you mentioned the Japanese <coughs> cemetery was moved here from, where did you say? Plains. From Plains. Where they had buried the labors before that. Well, there was a Chinese cemetery at the base of Mount Jumbo. Yes. And that was moved at some point. Did that come here? No, it wasn't moved. <laughs> there's a pieces? They desecrated. No, no. This there's a school in house as well. Yeah. It's like a state law that, that the only way that you can um, close a cemetery, use it for anything other than what it's dedicated to, which is burying the dead. Um, you're supposed to first remove all the burials in it to another cemetery or whatever, but Montana's not real great about that. Because the poor farm, they're still buried up there too. There's another school now. So. No. Now I understood that the see? Chinese people came, the relatives came, and they took their relatives back to China. That they reinterred them in China. I know. I bet you I know we heard the story. I never heard okay. that. Uh -huh. um, there was a man from Japan, and um, he called me one day and he asked if, if somebody was buried here and it was Japanese name. And I looked it up and I said, well, I have this name and it looks close to, to who you're looking for and everything. Well, he had spent years trying to figure out where Zula was in Montana, because that's where, you know, his, his grandfather died. And, um, I said, no, I, I think we have the right name and stuff, but what he did is he came here. He wanted to um, disinter his grandfather and take him back to Japan, but down in that railroad area isn't marked real well. And we, I, I just told him, I said, I can't be positive that it will be your grandfather because I don't know exactly who laid it out when they moved up there and, and because we have a, a lot of graves that are unmarked that area. So what he did is he came with a Hindu priest and he took his grandfather's soul back to Japan. And then another family came about four years ago and um, and to visit and stuff. But they've been publishing the list from here in Japan to see if any other families. Because these young men passed away in their late twenties, early Thursday, thir or thirties. They had come to the United States to make money Sit back but that I haven't heard about any Chinese taking their relatives, so I would they say they weren't Japanese though, they were Chinese. Yeah, that's what I mean. I, I never heard that. According to what I have heard that when they built Prescott School up there and did the basements for some of the houses, they found a lot of the graves. Do you know But they just left them there. It was was because this one is actually here. Now, there's so many people, but I did go to Prescott School, and it was on down at the base of, like below the bench of Mount Jumbo, up behind Harrison Street, I think at the end of Locust, when they were digging some houses. Not for the school, then they might have in the school as well, but I know they found some they found then some at that bench, and you know, that was a lot of years ago. And so when you say they desecrated it, my best guess is not. I remember the big furor about that they had found bones, and of course immediately they said they were Indian graves. You know, this was, but they built the new festival school in 52, I think, so probably sometime before that, and, and but then they said no, they had found Chinese graves there, but 
you know, what, what, how do you suppose they told that, you know, I mean, that was a lot of science shares ago too, but um, I don't think those were, those were supposed to be. Seems to be what they were saying. I would think I if I would think if they were going to move graves out of there, there would have been something mentioned in the newspaper or some kind of an article. But you can go back, um, go down the library even and trace it, you know, back if you can. Mm. And hey, if you find that's true, let us know. We'll put it okay, on okay. Book. I was just wondering what you guys knew about. That's yeah. the only thing I know that yeah. those are ones that I remember the writings about. And then we all used to be. And also, it's my understanding that the first cemetery was in that same area in the Lower Rattlesnake. Not where the Chinese cemetery was, but in that same general area, and that it was moved, lock, stock, and barrel, to the new site, which I assume is this. Here in the community. It's Mr. Higgins Cemetery that's moved here. <laughs> but he had land out at Southwest Higgins, and his family was moved here, because a lot of the, the gravestones around him People passed away in the 1700s, oh, and yet oh, this oh, didn't start in 1986. So okay. there were quite a few moves, but Thank I don't you. remember any of that. The other reason. Then I don't know everything either. Sharon's been here a long time. She knows a lot. Yeah. I've talked to a lot of people that have come in and asked questions simply and then put together kind of a history book that we keep in the office. No one's allowed to think, out. I put it together and there's no copies of it. But I used articles out of the Missoulian, you know, and, and things that, that people were trying to keep track of. Okay. It would be exciting if you could do that. Yeah. It would be. Ready? I'm ready. Thank you. Charles Marshall was a judge, and the one thing I do know about him all that's personal is his a, a descendant of his is now on the Missoula Cemetery Board as well. And she was out here dressed in wonderful long black robe during the stories in stone. And I was interested because she was reading just as I'm going to read you because I don't know about him. And I thought, well that's strange that you know it's her family member I would think that she would be standing here but what she related to us was is that she tried to put the story together very carefully with details from all the different family members and they were all sort of conflicting no that isn't true well this is true you know how family members would get on their history and so in order to be precise she read just as I'll be talking about it now Thomas C. Marshall was born in Paducah, Kentucky on December 14, 1851 and was the third in his family he was reared and educated in his native town and took a law course in the Kentucky University at Louisville, where he graduated in March of 1875. Previous to his graduation, he had spent two years in the office with his father and brother-in-law, and soon after leaving college, he began to practice the practice of his profession in Ballard County, Kentucky, and practiced there and in McCracken County until he was elected judge of the former county in the fall of 18. At the end of his term, he declined to be a candidate for the second time, and in 1883, he came direct to Missoula, Montana, where he formed a law partnership with Judge Woody, under the firm name of Woody and Marshall. They did a successful business until 1887, at which time the partnership was dissolved. Mr. Marshall then became the lawyer of the Missoula Mercantile Company, the First National Bank of Missoula, and the Big Blackfoot Milling Company by all of which he has retained his best counsel, and all of which are doing a very extensive business. In addition to this, he conducts a general law practice, and since June 1883, has been a member of the firm of Marshall, Francis, and Corbett, which was organized at that time. Mr. Francis is attorney for the Northern Pacific Railroad and for a portion of Montana and Idaho, and Mr. Corbett has recently come to this state from Kentucky. The firm of Marshall, Francis, and Corbett, although recently organized, has gained the reputation of being one of the strongest law firms in the state. Did you notice this quick change of tense? Um, a lot of the stories in stone are given in present tense, so you're just giving part of history. 
Mr. Marshall is interested in various business enterprises. He's a director of the First National Bank of Missoula and vice president of the South Missoula Land Company. On his farm near Missoula, he's giving considerable attention to the raising of Jersey cattle and fine trotting horses. Some of the latter having made famous records. From his professional duties, Mr. Marshall turns to his ranch for recreation in his time stock takes a pardonable pride. Politically, he has been a staunch Democrat all of his life. In the fall of 1886, he was elected by his party as a member of the legislature of Montana and served during the regular session and also in the extending session of 1887. While a member of that body, he had the honor of being chairman of the Judiciary Committee. June 12, 1878, Mr. Marshall married Miss Millie T. Jenkins, a native of Ballard County, Kentucky, and a daughter of Dr. Thomas Jenkins, a prominent physician in that state. Mr. and Mrs. Marshall have four children, Anna J., Miriam, Emily, and Charles S. Fraternally, Mr. Marshall is identified with the A O U W K of P K of What's that, Sharon? <laughs> and the F and AM. And if you can, that will be on the test tomorrow that you will be asked to tell me what those fraternities are. <laughs> Mr. Marshall died on April 23rd, 1911. I'm wondering, um, Judge Marshall's party, or partner, Woody, has a very long biography in here. Are you interested in reading it, or is it something that you would enjoy reading at home? <laughs> Is that all right? Alright, so we'll go around. Oh, you guessed wrong. of the facade, you see his 
Dane. He's also responsible for Main Hall at the University of Montana, and as well as other buildings on the campus. He also built smaller residential homes. Um, I think what's interesting about this cemetery tour is for all of you who have been on other tours this week, it's time to see the rest of the story. I mean, we talked about the wardens, and earlier this week we met Tommy Lou Warden. Uh, we saw the warden home on East Pine Street and Tommy Lou's home on Carroll in the University. Today on the tour of the lower rattlesnake, we were talking about uh, A.J. Gibson and the rocks in the cemetery. And it, it's just fun to come out and experience the cemetery where many of these prominent Missoulians were buried. And some of the, perhaps, the not so prominent, and maybe a few of the notorious. But I encourage you to come out on your own because it's really fun to explore. It's great place to It is. Thank you. Are you? original stone or was it put on later? That I don't know. I, don't know. I would say it's probably the original. Um, mostly a lot of stones aren't put on later. A lot of stones the families like if someone passes away the summer before the fall or whatever. They always want this, a monument in place before Memorial Day when they want to bring out flowers and that. You know and, and something like this I don't know if, if people are well I noticed that um, you know who built God's office is the attorney well his son passed away in um, his grandfather and his grandmother are buried over in the Eagle Plots and now they um, they have their stones made in Greece out of Grecian stone so they usually come three to four years after but most stones, I think, are put in place within a year or two of the person passing. One thing that you asked about is stone, and, and it, since you don't have your book, it's out. This is one thing that I especially, I found interesting, and you probably know this, but it, it talks about Mr. Gibson. And it says he retired in 1909 and began to make automobile history here. He and his wife, in 1910, made the first automobile trip from Missoula to New York. In 1911, they made the first tour ever made by an automobile in the Northwest cities and states. He was prominent in business and civic affairs and also helped form the local automobile club. He and Mrs. Gibson, in an unfortunate accident, died on December 31, 1927, when stalled on a railroad crossing in their automobile. Very sad. One thing I learned this week, and I'm going to pursue this, is that when Mr. Gibson retired, which is around 1910, 1915, somewhere in there, an architect named Ole Bakke took over the practice. Well, I know Gary Bakke of the Tire Bakke family. And next time I see Gary, I'm going to have him tell me all about his grandfather or his uncle Ole. And in the university area, we have those sidewalk stamps that are horseshoe shaped that say Bakke Brothers. So it's interesting to tie in the history of the different areas. And I can't wait to see Gary Bakke. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing that's interesting is, as we say, when we talk, we'll talk to you about Mary Green or Pine, G-L-E-I-M, and it's interesting because when we talked about the lower rattlesnake, yes, Ken Bakke was my, in my class at Prescott School. Gary was a little boy, though. But it's interesting because in those days they were backwards. And so, uh, it be, uh, and who knows, you know, and when they decided with the rattlesnake. I think they're all Bakke. So, if I were to, to speak to someone about that family, they would say, no, no, you don't know them, it's a different family. It's a, a little different. Is it the same way? Indeed, it is the same family. Uh, 
Jerry was saying that you were kind of lying about all those people. They were all bad. But then you look at it, to be either. We're two now, Sharon. To the Greeno and Higgins, which are buried in the sand. The um, headstone that says Jacobs is my husband's name. And when I read to you about First National Bank uh, and some of the partners and attorneys for First National Bank, that was his family. And, and that started with his grandfather, whose name was A.R. Jacobs. So, so that's their family plot. And the headstone right in front of it that says, if you can pronounce it, Shoy. I'm sure somewhere in your travels around this alone studying history, you heard of Prof Choi, uh, who was a professor at the University of Montana and served once as an interim president at the University of Montana. Uh, that's Prof Choi's headstone. And I can't see it quite here, but if sometime when you're out here, next story headstone will break it. My husband out here, because he's standing down in here, he can tell you more of these. But right over to the left there is the McLean stone, and that is Norman McLean's parents. If you go to see the river next to it, his parents are buried right over there. Norman McLean and my father were born in about a week apart and lived and over by the Presbyterian Church at Jacob's home was over in that area. It's since been torn down. They went to what was then Roosevelt grade school together. Norman is not buried here, but the famous Hanson Hall. It's Mr. and Mrs. McLean Hall. who are right over there. It's a whitish stone. You so, uh, want to come out and have a nice walk someday? You can say it's over at home. It's very important. It's very important. We have a lot of people that call for hours. I think the call is great. And they always ask for Norman to bury him, wherever his wife is. <laughs> I, think, I think he's in Chicago. Is he? Um, is, if I remember right. I've been wrong before tonight, so we're But I, I think he's in uh, And you can't have lived in this room for more than five minutes and, and not know that the Higgins family must have been quite important if you may one of the main streets. Um, and but Mr. Higgins came to the United States when he was 18 years old and immediately came west, um, that he might defend his newfound home against the enemies from within as well as from without. He enlisted in the army, and after five years of active service in the group of dragoons, he joined Governor Stevens, the famous Indian fighter in the Northwest. With him, he helped in the original survey for the Northern Pacific. He was with him in 55 when the treaty was drawn up with the Nez Perce. This was the treaty which led to the final peace covenant with the Flatheads and the Ponderay. The following season, the party went to Fort Benton where they negotiated with the Black people. This done, their labors among the Indians ended, and the little company disbanded in Olympia, Washington. In recognition of his services, Mr. Higgins was soon given the permission to have him in the army in order to carry on his work of subduing the Indians. Until 1856, he remained in this branch of service when he was assigned to the Quartermaster's Department. For four years more, he served his country, two years at the time, acting as government agent at Walla Walla. In 1860, he resumed his life as a civilian and purchased Mr. Isaac's business in the mercantile or business of Warden and Isaacs of Walla Walla. Loading his share of the merchandise in the docks of 75 pound animals, he went through the Hobo County and set up business for himself in the little city of Missoula. Here, for the remainder of his life, he devoted himself to the upbuilding of the town. Here, his son Ronald was born. In 65, he went to join the first lumber house in the vicinity, and in 70, he built the block that is still known as 
Always cracked and dry, um, but it, it was a lovely place, and you know, a lot of people in this little were disappointed the freeway took it out. Um, Mr. Greeno was originally from Iowa. He lived in Kansas, Texas, Mexico, Colorado, and South Dakota before coming to Montana with $500 he had saved from working the South Dakota gold mines. He married his wife, Tennessee, at about that time, and then the family homesteaded in Clinton. He started a lumber mill that later moved to the Bonner area and supplied all the ties for construction of the NP Railway between the Dakotas and Washington. He built his family home just east of Rouse Creek in 1897. The home was designed by A.J. Gibson, the man we just heard about, and decorated by Englishman Bailey Morris. Wrought iron fencing surrounded the grounds. The home had 22 rooms with six baths and two fireplaces. You all know it now as the mansion where fine dining was enjoyed by everyone. Mr. A.J. Mosby purchased it after it was moved because it was in the way of the new interstate. And that was in the 1960s. In addition to his mill, Thomas Greeno held mining interests in Missoula, Butte, Anaconda, and Idaho, and was on the board of directors of a half dozen banks in Missoula, in Montana, Idaho, and Washington. He died at age 60 in 1911. And there was family living in the house until it was moved in 1965. It was a wonderful place to trick or treat because it was the only time of year that it was okay to go on the grounds. I would like to say not that it was the only time of year you went on the grounds. <laughs> you were always welcome. was a loss when it burned down. When did they hand out the holes in the show? Oh, so do you know, I'm glad you asked. You want to get a shot? Go. There was um, a son who had some severe learning disabilities in that he did not speak. 
strategic plan, this man Stone um, had to approve a, a plaque for a former board member. I mean, all this was just today in the meeting. So there's a lot more to this. I got, I decided I wanted to be on the cemetery board because I'm just plain like walking through them. But guess what? That is important. <laughs> yeah, that's a great story. That's the one that I mentioned we big, could big guess. We Thank you. little vote to see how we were pronounced it. I, I heard it think it's fine. And this is one that people enjoy because you notice it's sitting at this direction that we have This is because this lady decided that she would have her stones set facing the road. That's the leg. Yes, I don't think it's true. It's not in right. Mary Glyme was of Irish descent. She had said of her, her origin that her father was a squire in Ireland, a landowner but not of the nobility. She could converse in all the Latin languages and was liberally educated in English. Her only relatives 